we need to get kind of superintendents, chief financial officers, school boards understanding the threat that cybersecurity is posing to everyone, whether it's a provider or the school districts. Welcome back to another episode of the PowerCast here in San Antonio, Texas, ISTE 2025, joined by my co-host and Group VP of Sales for PowerSchool, Ryan Imbriali. Hey, everybody. And, yeah, let, hey, everybody. Welcome to Ryan, <laughs> jumping in the seat. Our special guest is CEO of COSIN, Keith Kruger, and I want the hat, so you got to come back and, and, okay. and do another episode with the hat on. Without so. headset. Yes, but thank you for, for being on the show and <laughs> spending a little time with us today. Good to be here. Okay, so I am a, a novice at anything ISTE and COSIN. Can you just give me an sure. overview and the aims of the organization? Sure. Uh, COSIN helps school district uh, technology leaders and their teams. So we really focus on things like uh, uh, equity, things like um, uh, data use of data privacy, uh, cybersecurity, um, things like AI. You might have heard about that. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. So uh, whereas ISTE has a core competency around in the classroom, te preparing teachers, if that's an easy way to think about it. Okay. We really focus on school system issues. Gotcha. So but you're, you're equipping the school so that the instructional technology works and the, yeah, there in you the go. classroom. And people like Ryan, we've been working with for a long time, well before he was at Power School, oh. when he was at Baltimore County. Well, well, Ryan, I know you had a question that was top of mind. I know top of mind for a lot of educators around the country. Well, it's just the, the timings uh, ideal here. First of all, uh, Keith, you look fantastic. Uh, Keith and I have known each other for, uh, as he said, a long time. And so, you know, luckily both of us has, have aged like fine wine. Um, here, here, here's my thing. Boxed wine? Uh, from, on fine your... boxed wine fine. from Trader oh. Joe's for $3. This just went south. Buck all right. Two uh, buck <laughs> which you can't get in Maryland, oh, by okay. the way. Well. It's a problem. All right. So I, I, I think everyone in the space uh, over, the, over the course of the last half year have, have been concerned about what was to be of E-rate. And, and I, I want to preface this for our audience and, and just say, you know, and this is coming truly from my heart. Like, Keith, the work you have done personally the work COSIN has done um, across decades around this topic um, and around the work in Washington to ensure E-rate is a, um, is a like, like the walls of a building, um, is incredible. All that to say, there's been some challenges over the, over the course of the last half year, year building up. And so huge news just recently Ta -da -da -da. and can you uh, yes. this, can can you just past, talk about what just has happened and, and why it matters Friday, we had just a huge win uh, the US Supreme Court which was making lots of other decisions that some people may or may not like but this particular uh, issue on a 6-3 vote uh, splitting uh, they had both uh, liberal and conservative justices saying what the e-rate does is constitutional if we had lost that, we could have uh, lost the most important funding for education technology. Uh, for, for almost 30 years, uh, E-rate uh, e has been the largest funding source. And the, the amazing thing about it is that it's not dependent upon who's in Congress. Or, uh, it, it, uh, when we pay our telephone bills, uh, there's a little line that says universal service. And actually, it's a very old program, almost 100 years. Uh, connecting rural America to telephone service. And in 1996, COSIN uh, worked to educate Congress and say, you know, we ought to connect schools and libraries and it ought to go down to the classroom level. And so um, it's absolutely essential. It's the biggest, it's the, if, if you considered it a federal program, uh, because actually it's sort of separate. Quasi. Quasi. Yeah. Uh, it would be the fourth biggest education program. Wow. Wow. And so this ruling essentially, is it 
is it a status quo ruling? It, it is or, a status quo. Well, like what now what? It is a status quo. There are still other challenges that we have with the E-rate in the way that it's funded. It's funded on old tele uh, long distance rates. And so not everybody pays into it. So we have a problem with the financial structure, but the actual program itself is constitutional and will continue. And, and it isn't just a win for schools and libraries. It's a win for rural hospitals. It's a win for rural uh, ratepayers, which could have gone through the roof. Every, all of it is about a $9 billion a year program. Uh, E-rate is less than half of that. Amazing. Thank, I, again, thank you. Thank all the COSIN members, the other um, NGOs who have worked so hard on this issue. Uh, it, it, it matters to all of us, whether we are right. uh, corporate in the education space or whether we're in a classroom or yeah. a parent. Yeah, we, we just wouldn't have the infrastructure. And, you know, we see around the world that the E-rate program is, uh, you know, about universal service, making sure that every school, every library, every uh, rural hospital, every, uh, you know, are all uh, connected to, to increasingly broadband rates and broadband connectivity. Mm. Thanks. I have a, a cybersecurity question, if I can pick your brain quickly. Um, you know, it feels like districts have not really adopted cybersecurity protocols to the strength that they probably need. Um, it's, it's almost an afterthought in, uh, sometimes. How should we be thinking about cybersecurity and the necessity of it like for yeah. school districts? Well, and I, and I love that you're a former superintendent because we need to get yes. kind of superintendents, chief financial officers, school boards understanding the threat that cybersecurity is posing to everyone, whether it's a provider or the school districts. We know that things like ransomware, K-12 is the number one targeted sector. There's a reason for that, right? There's because we're the least defended we're probably? The least, that's exactly <laughs> yes. right. We have lots of data and we have, um, unfortunately, we're a soft target. Oh, yes. And uh, so we have we do a survey each year. Last year we found that only one in three, even though this was the number one issue for our chief technology officers, we asked them, well, do you have even one full-time equivalent working on cybersecurity? The criminals do. Oh, they got, <laughs> they got, they're well they equipped. Got, they are hammering on your network. Oh, gosh. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, so we're under, under resourced from a human capacity. You know, and we just haven't, you know, we, we also ask a question, you know, here, here are major cyber threats. Now, I just mentioned that ransomware is the number one risk of any industry sector, according to Homeland Security. Yeah. And yet, I think it was only 12% of our CTOs said that they felt they were at, at high risk. Wow. So wow. even though they, we, our audience will really? say it's our number one priority along with AI, uh, there's a severe under uh, appreciation of what is really at risk. Do you think it, it's because of the cost? Is it because of you You typically have a small group of, of experts that know enough about cybersecurity yeah. in a school district and it doesn't permeate to the other? It's a part-time responsibility. They, okay. And, and uh, hiring someone like a chief security officer is something that school very few school districts could ever afford. Right. Um, so, it, you know, that that's all the more reason why it's important for school districts, for states, for education service agencies to come together and aggregate expertise. It's particularly why it's so important the federal government has provided um, funding through Homeland Security for something called MSISEC. This is sounds a little geeky and only the geeky people like Ryan and I care about these things. But they provide free or low cost uh, services to school districts and other public sector, um, you know, cities, sure. municipalities, states, municipalities yep. Yep. ports, things like that. Unfortunately, uh, in March, on a Friday night, all of that money was uh, eliminated overnight. Oh. So, you know, we talk about careful planning. Now, fortunately, MSISEC uh, said for three months, you know, we're going to keep it going. We'll use reserves. And so we haven't yet seen the, the drop-off, but they just announced now that school districts, every school district, 
um, they'll have a, will now have to pay for many of these free services. And what I worry about, what keeps me up at night, is many of these small, particularly rural districts. Yeah, well, we who, have plenty in here, Texas that exactly yeah. who have tons of data. They're usually the largest employer in a community. They have lots of personal information. You know, and, yeah. and you might say, well, you know, if you're like a school board member or parent, like what what is it that school districts have that that's so valuable? And it's it's not the grades <laughs> that no. the kids have. Surely but, not mine. <laughs> but you might have their birth dates and uh yes. social security. Yeah. So social the, security numbers maybe. So those things are a special PII. It's all there. Exactly. So just the moment when the student turns 18, the cyber criminal will uh, apply for credit cards or credit in your name. And it may take a year or two before the student or parent ever figures out that that this has happened. So a little bit of a hard shift, Keith. So we we talked about E-rate, cybersecurity. So where is COSIN? What is COSIN doing right now to help educate CTOs, CIOs, the broader education community around Gen AI? Yeah, we've been doing a lot. Uh, Over the last two years, we partnered uh, with the Council of the Great City Schools, which are the big urban school districts, and we built a maturity model. And we've now taken that maturity model, which was terrific for um, school district teams. We don't believe that just the CIO, CTO can lead uh, AI. AI is something that touches every yes. or should touch every, every, facet. every facet. And it has to start with the superintendent uh, saying that this is a priority yep. and you have to involve operations. And uh, so the maturity model looks at seven different domains and, and we've built out uh, lots of um, uh, kind of a self-assessment. So you can say in this area, here's where we are. And here, if we want to move up the maturity model, what we would be doing. And it's a we really think it's a team effort. So with the help of the Gates Foundation, we've been partnering with education service agencies. They have lots of different names in all kinds of different states, county offices, BOCES, blah, 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 blah. Uh, But the the point of the matter is there are probably 60% of the the districts in the country are pretty small, less than 2,500 students. And they're not going to come to a national conference So working, we're doing a train the trainer, working with education service agencies to do this facilitation at a really low level, lower level. We haven't done this in our 30 years of existence. So it's a real breakthrough. And we think if we, you know, start effectively working with those education service agencies, all the other professional development we've developed on cybersecurity and on privacy of data can be deployed to those smaller districts. You know, th- when when educators talk about data, typically they're talking about student data and growth measures, what accountability, those types of things. Across an ecosystem, what are the things that school districts should be considering? Whole picture data, real time data, yeah. impact of a decision over here to student outcomes, how should they visualize or engage in those type of discussions? Well, uh, about a decade ago, you know, the, the privacy of data, the legal com- constraints are quite old. Uh, FERPA, yes. uh, the federal law, you know, is almost 50 years old. As, I've, used that, I've used that excuse a yeah. bunch of times. Uh, uh, it's FERPA. I can't, I can't share that with you. Right. <laughs> but in reality, uh, it isn't just that there are legal things. There are best practices. So we pulled together a bunch of school districts and created something called the Trusted Learning Environment Seal. It's a, uh, there are 25 practices in five domains or buckets. And I think we need to get every school district moving towards those best practices, some of which are legal, some of which are just the best way to do it. And, um, you know, we're, so I would encourage anyone who's interested in conveying to their parents, their community, their school board, that they're doing well, g- great practice on privacy. Take a look at the Trusted Learning Environment Seal. And the new thing, it's, it's very hard to achieve it because you have to achieve all 25 practices. So we had very few districts that ever made it. So this past year, we've broken it down into mini seals. There are five of them so that school districts can start to see progress. We're also working with state departments of ed. So we have four states now where there are cohorts of districts working together. 
So Indiana, Illinois, South Carolina, North Carolina are our first betas. So we're trying a lot of new things. You know, it, it couldn't be more important in an AI world to get the, the data privacy stuff right. Yes, I, yeah. I would assume that as AI continues to evolve, the ability for bad actors to leverage it and steal data, ransomware, is only going to increase exponentially. So yes. much like just the acceptance of AI from the instructional practices, the cybersecurity uh, urgency probably needs to be ramped up accordingly as well. We like to say that it's two sides of, this, of the same coin, cybersecurity and pri privacy of data. Privacy okay. of data tends to be more the practice and the policies. Right. And, uh, you know, the cybersecurity is the hardcore. How, yeah. how, how are you keeping it safe once but you have it? You, you have to do both. And we are getting a lot of attention around the cybersecurity conversation. Sure. But we think that the privacy conversation is just as accurate. And we, uh, you being a former superintendent might be interested. We did a the first ever national privacy survey that we released in February. And uh, the big, even 70% um, of the people who are, who say they're the lead privacy person in the district don't have privacy requirements in their job description. Now that's something that that superintendents and HR folks need to start paying attention to. Because yes. if it really is their job, then yeah. we need to define it and we need to get better at it. No doubt, because yeah, when something goes wrong, you're getting the call. It's, it's, you sit in the seat, you're, you're getting the call, yeah. <laughs> regardless of it's, if it's your, you know, what your your expertise is in or not. Um, so I would agree with that 100%. You have to be well informed um, yeah. to respond. And, and things uh, as a system don't move without the superintendent. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Keith, um, put you on the spot. How many how many ISTEs is this for you? <laughs> I was just thinking, I think I started, I, I'm earning my white hair. Uh, 1994, I think. How about you? I, I couldn't remember the, I, I think I'm at it 28. Was, Okay. It's been a long time. Yes. Okay, I, I got I to gotta ask the, the same question I asked Ryan earlier today. Do you, do you recall any landmark years where things exploded? Oh, it's a good question. Technology. Well, I, I'll, I've been working with Kosin for 30 years, and uh, I came on just as Mosaic and the browser and um, the public internet moved from you know having been for secure in the sure. department of defense to consumers and i think this is equally with ai as exciting a moment as that was we were at that time you know most people were talking about let's get one connection to a school yeah and we pushed hard that it ought to be in every classroom and that's how e-rate defined that it was not just to the school but to the classroom but i think uh AI is, uh, you know, as they say, the fourth industrial revolution. I agree. And uh, it's going to change everything. Mm. Wow. It's amazing. If we just need to do it right. Yeah, I, w I would agree 100%. Okay, so, Keith, uh, first of all, uh, Power School, proud partner B with Cosin. Yes, proud um, partner. Well, you know, uh, you have an annual conference. We do. When, when's that? We're going to be in April in Chicago. So uh, Awesome. All right. Windy City, April. We'd Chicago. Love, love to see all you. All right. Uh, COSN.org? COSN.org? Yep. That's it. Thank you so much Thank for giving you. us some time here. I know your schedule is jam-packed <laughs> uh, during ISTE. Always have um, time for you. And appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Take care. We'll see you next time on the PowerCast. <laughs>